That little church on Liberty Hill. Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty Hill. All right, go ahead and open to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. Um, we we'll be in 13 and 14. We're going to wrap up 13 real quick um, and then move on to chapter 14. Um, we talked about Luke 13 was a really heavy chapter. Um, and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, it, it, it's not about to get much lighter. Um, oh, it's going to get a little more fun, but the points are going to be just as deep. Right? Jesus had just talked about how there are going to be those to whom he will say, I'm sorry, who are you? That at the end, that whenever it comes, people are going to say, hey, Lord, Lord, remember me. And he's going to say, I, I don't know who you are. And that's kind of a hard thing. Stop and think, though, who he's talking to whenever he says this. He's talking to the people who think we're the in crowd. Even some who are doing everything religiously okay, exactly right, dotting all their I's, crossing all their T's, making sure all of their religious activity was exactly what they're told it is supposed to be. The Pharisees, who he's talking to, and he says, even among you guys. And the issue was, if you remember, is a matter of the heart. When it comes right down to it, it's a matter of pride, of selfishness, of wanting to be in charge. Thank you, God, for this world. I'll take it from here. Don't need you anymore. I'm the center, I'm the focused, I'm what's important. That's the root of all sin. And that's the issue there. As you can imagine, it's not going to be a very popular message, especially when he is talking to the people who are the ones who are supposedly getting it all right. Um, the most self-righteous and prideful people hanging around. In Luke 13, verse 31, this is how uh, they respond after he gives them that message. He says, On that very day, some Pharisees came and they said to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. I don't think this was a friendly warning. I, I'm pretty sure this was a threat. Verse 32, he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures. Today, tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must journey today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. First off, I love whenever people say, Hey, Christians, we don't need to get political. Okay, there's a certain degree to which when I'm up here, I don't preach politics, but we as the church do need to get involved in some stuff. But Jesus just made a direct insulting statement about a head of state. You go tell that fox, sly, conniving, scheming, worthless, no good. You go tell him, and what do you say? You tell him, I'm going to be out casting out some demons and healing some people. saying that, yeah, he's going to die, all right, but it's going to be on his terms, not on Herod's. And if Herod wants to come do something about it, well, both Jesus and Herod know that while Jesus is out casting out demons and healing the sick and teaching the good word, if Herod comes and does something, that's going to fall on Herod's shoulders, not Jesus. That'll turn the people against Herod. So Jesus knows he's okay there. Verse 34, however... Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." There's a few moments where we get these kind of things from Jesus, and, and, and I love them because so often the, the picture, the image that people have of God, um, especially like maybe some Old Testament stuff, but, but it just in general is that God is just um, this angry, vindictive, right? That he's gleefully dishing out punishment on evildoers. This is not the image Jesus is portraying. Right, the Bible says, you want to see God? Just look at Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? He's lamenting. Oh, Jerusalem, I wish you would have come to me, but you weren't willing. 
that the image that we get of God in the Bible is not the vindictive, like I said, gleefully dishing out punishment. It's the brokenhearted judge with tears in his eyes as the gavel falls. God desires for people to come to him, but he has given us the ability to say no. And so many people do, and it grieves him when people turn away. But now, Jesus gets an invitation to lunch from a Pharisee. And things are going to go horribly wrong. Not for Jesus, they're going to go horribly wrong for the Pharisee. Chapter 14, verse 1. And now it happened as Jesus went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, they, that they watched him closely, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Stop there for a second. I think this is a perfect example of why it's important that we need to read the Bible with a more analytical eye, a little bit more of a critical eye. That as we read, we need to kind of take some background knowledge and bring it into what we're reading so we kind of understand what's going on here. Because in that sentence, there is a ton that can be unpacked about this scene that is about to unfold. First off, we see Jesus eating at a Pharisee's house, a ruler of the Pharisees, mind you. Not, not even just some guy, you know, who's like just joined the club. Right? This is one of the head guys. Now, at this point in Christ's ministry... Why would a Pharisee be inviting Jesus to lunch? They've done nothing but fight and argue and plot to kill him. They're inviting him to lunch? Okay, that right there should send up some red flags. Something's going on. And then it says everyone was watching him closely. That's got to be an awkward lunch. You get invited to lunch. Hey, Jesus, come over to my house for lunch. And he's sitting there and he's having his lunch and everybody's just staring at him. What's he going to do? That's going to be a little awkward. Something's going on here and we see what it is says that there is a man with dropsy. You know what dropsy is? It's an older term. It's swelling. It's like fluid in between tissues, and it looks like swelling, but it's you know, fluid gathering in places. This is a disease that among the um, first century Jews, that this man would be viewed as unclean. He, he, because of the illness, he is seen as impure, unclean. You cannot be around this man. A Pharisee? The people who are the most legalistic, nitpicky, they make up rules on top of rules on top of rules just to make sure they're keeping the law right. And a man with dropsy is at his dinner party? Something ain't right here. And we're about to see what it is. It's a trap what it is. We have a Sabbath plus a man needing a healing plus a crowd to watch. Apparently they haven't been paying attention because um, Jesus kind of specializes in this sort of thing. See, what, what, what they're setting up is, okay, here's this man who needs to be healed. Here's Jesus, a healer, but it's the Sabbath. So what you going to do, Jesus? Are you going to heal him? Because that would be breaking the Sabbath according to our tradition. Are you not going to heal him? You incompassionate, thoughtless, uncaring. You have the power to heal this man and you don't do it, right? So, so they've kind of set up this, you know, darned if you do, darned if you don't kind of scenario for Jesus. They think they've got him in a trap. Verse 3. They should have known better. Verse 3. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they kept silent. Well, of course they kept silent. He just turned the tables on them and sprung their trap on them. Because no matter which way they answer, they're going to be in trouble. Because they're going to say, yes, you can heal. Oh, but wait a minute, your tradition says no. Or then they say, no, you can't heal. Why not? You cold-hearted, uncaring, uncompassionate person. Right? He, he just turned the tables on them. And he took him, the man, and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him. So, like I said, some people never learn. 
If you look in the book of Luke, at this point, there's been about six or seven other scenarios go on where someone brings someone to Jesus on the Sabbath and he heals them, and then he gets in a tussle with the Pharisees over healing on the Sabbath. And he wins every single time. They just don't learn. Here we are again on the Sabbath. He's healing someone. And he points out their hypocrisy that they wouldn't consider it a violation on the Sabbath to go help their ox or their donkey. Oh, but we can't heal a human being on the Sabbath. No, 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 that's wrong. They couldn't answer him because they knew no answer was possible. They had been exposed for their hypocrisy and they knew it. But remember what the point is. We always have to be careful that we don't just take a, a passage out of Scripture and just look it up by itself. There's more going on. The, the passages just before tie into the thought process and the idea that's going on in this passage. And it's that idea of it's a matter of the heart. There are those who can do everything religiously correct, but their heart is far from God. Verse 7, so he told a parable to those who are invited. He's not going to let this drop. He's now shamed them and humiliated them. And for some reason, they stay and take more. But he's going to keep dishing it out. Verse 7. And so Jesus told a parable to those who were invited. He's speaking to the guests. We're going to see him speak to three different people or groups of people. And he turns to the guests. He says, when he noted how they chose the best places. And he says to them, when you were invited by anyone to a wedding feast. Do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him to come say to you, give a place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes may say, friend, no, no, go up higher. When you have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let's explain what's going on here. The way things would have sat at, at a, this type of uh, situation or at a wedding party, uh, it would have been a U-shaped table. That, 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 that's a U. That's not a U. That, okay. It would have been a U-shaped table. And the head of the table, the centerpiece at the bottom of the U was the host. That was the person, the, the you know, guest of honor or, or the host of the party. And immediately to his right or to his left would have been the favored seats of the highest honor. And then it would have gone down from there you know, to the people down at the far end of the table who they would have been, you know, I mean, they got invited. So I guess there's something there. But, so the, the, the social status moves up as you get closer to the U. <clears throat> and what Jesus had witnessed, because it says that he saw how they had sought out the honored places. So he's at this party and he's seeing people come in and they're each trying to get to the best seats. Right? You, you know how it is, you come in and you're not quite ready to sit down yet, so ladies, you just hang your purse on the chair, right? Write your name on the cup and just kind of set it there. Or, or you come walking up and, hey, you wanted that seat, but they're not here. Just move that over. I'll sit down right here, right? Right? This is how this stuff goes. Right? They're, they're, they're trying to get the best seat. Or you see a seat over there that you want, but someone's already sitting there, so you have your friend, but hey, man, come here. And as soon as they get up, you run over there and sit down. Right? I mean, just, that's what they're doing. They're, 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 they're trying to get the honored places. I deserve to sit into the better places. But he says, don't seek glory for yourselves. He's not talking about seating arrangements. You get that, right? His point is not about where you sit at the party. His point is a matter of the heart. Quit trying to seek out the high honor and the high glory and the prestige for yourself. Now, we don't often do this necessarily in seating arrangement, but we have our own ways we do this, don't we? Nice house, nice car, what brand are you wearing? We have different ways that we recognize social status, who you know, jobs you have. I remember one time, and this, I think I've shared this story before on a different issue, but it, it stuck out to me that I, I'm, at, I'm, at a, um, I, I'm at a party. It was uh, some political party thing. My, my dad invited me to me, and I thought, sure, why not? There's free food. And so I'm there, and I see the congressman at the time, and I'm like, hey, I like this guy. 
I like the job he's doing. Let me go shake his hand and say thank you. So I walk up and I'm like, hey, Congressman, I appreciate what you're doing. I liked your vote on this issue. You're doing a good job. Just keep up the good work. While I'm talking to him, another man literally steps in front of me, in between me and the Congressman. I'm in mid-sentence and the man steps in front of me and starts talking to the Congressman like I wasn't even there. How, how prideful do you have to be? You don't even notice someone, or maybe you do notice someone, you don't care. Now, most of the things that we do are not that blatant. Most of the things we do, we tend to think of ourselves, I'm pretty, pretty nice person, pretty decent fellow. I would never treat somebody that way. But we have more subtle ways we do this, don't we? We see the car someone's driving, the job that they work. My wife worked at uh, Walmart as a cashier. And you want to talk about low on the social ladder? Walmart cashier, that, that's the place where people who are otherwise considered the dregs of society can go and then have someone they're better than and mistreat that cashier. Okay, that's just the, the, the way that social stuff kind of works. And there's just ways that we do that. It was the pride of the guests that he was addressing the selfishness in their hearts, and now he turns to the host. Personally, I don't know why these people haven't gotten up and left yet. Verse 12, Then he also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends or your brothers or your relatives nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Do not do things for other people just because they'll be able to repay you later. It's not a give and take. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not a, hey, let me help them and then they'll be able to help me. No, help people just to help them. Invite people just to invite them. By the way, notice the list that he said, don't invite your rich neighbors and friends. Instead, invite these people. Who were those people? Maimed, poor, lame, blind. These are all people that the people of Jesus' day would have looked at as being unclean and unworthy. Those are the people you do not invite. And he's saying, no, no, those are the ones you invite. You invite the ones that have nothing to offer you. But then it isn't true. I mean, I know, I know we don't probably necessarily always think in specifically in these terms, but it's just a little easier to help someone you know can pay you back. If you've got a friend that comes up and says, hey, I'm a little tight on money, could you possibly lend me a little bit and then you know, next week when I get my paycheck, I'll pay you back. Yeah, sure, I know you're good for it. And you got the friend that comes up and says, hey, I'm a little tight, you know, can you, uh, you know, lend me a little bit and then I'll pay you back when I get my paycheck next week and you think, you ain't employed. What paycheck? You're not paying me back? But are you willing to help? Whenever you lend money, is it with an open hand? I don't remember where I heard it. I'll credit it to my parents because they're so wise and wonderful. Right? I don't, but this idea that whenever you lend something, let it go. If you're going to hand something to somebody for them to use or to have, just expect you will never get it back and be okay with it. Whenever I was at the uh, Baptist student ministry, there were a few of us that started um, th- this little kind of side ministry thing that we were doing called Random Acts of Kindness. And because we were goofy college students, what we did is we, we, uh, our calling card that we used in this was the you know, barrel of monkeys, the little monkey. What we would do is, as things were going on and whatever, we would hear someone having a problem, we would see someone having a bad day, we would just kind of, kind of pick up on someone needing some encouragement and some kindness and whatever, and we would uh, go, and, and like while they were in class, we'd stick a note on their windshield, or if they're dumb enough to leave their door unlocked, we'd you know, put something in their car, or we'd do something somewhere, somehow, so they would come across an anonymous encouragement. And it was so funny to just kind of sit back and hear everybody going, who's doing this? What's going on? I, did you, I, I got one the other day, I was having a bad day, and they just showed up, and they're all trying to figure out who it is. I got nothing from that. And it went until years later, you know, that we actually fessed up and said, yeah, that was me. Didn't get anything out of that. 
just doing it for other people. No, I'm, I'm going to say I did get something out of it. It was fun. Doing good is fun. When you have the means and the ability to be a blessing to other people, I mean, you're not getting anything materially back there, but that is, it's fun. It feels good. Kind of just by lifting them, you lift you. It's, it's amazing how God designed that. Verse 15. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to Jesus, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Some people just don't get it. I mean, Jesus is basically, he's telling some parables that are just raking these guys over the coals, and one of them is like, yeah, heaven's going to be great. He hasn't figured out that Jesus is talking about him. Don't we do that sometimes? Some of you are probably doing it right now. Sitting here in a message going, oh, yes, I know someone who needs to hear this message. Yeah, you. I've already told you, half the time I'm preaching to myself, I could just put a mirror right here and it would apply. But it's so easy for us to sit there and you're hearing something good and you're thinking, oh, I know someone needs to hear this message. Yeah, you're probably them. This guy didn't get it. Verse 16. And then Jesus said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. And still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. That guy probably actually had a pretty good excuse. Verse 21, so the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Invited, hey, guys, you're invited, come on. And they all made excuses. And they're not bad, you notice, they're not bad excuses. They're reasonable things that you go, well, yeah, I mean, you kind of got to go take care of business. Right? A lot of times, one of the worst things that is the enemy of the best is just the good. Right? The things that trip us up and hang us up and pull us away from God aren't always dressed like wickedness. Sometimes it's perfectly good, reasonable things. Right? There's nothing wrong here with saying, hey, you know, I've bought some ground and you go inspect it. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I've got these, these new oxen, I'm mean, going to go check them out, make sure they didn't get ripped off. These aren't bad or wrong or sinful things, but they're being placed ahead of. Those who were first invited refused to come. This is a rather not subtle reference to Israel. I, I think the, the people sitting at that party would have known exactly who Jesus was talking to and what he meant. Those who were invited first didn't come. Hey, Israel, you were God's chosen people and you've rejected him. They know what he's talking about. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Again, these are all people that Jesus' dinner friends there would have recognized as unworthy. Those are the ones you don't invite. This would have been a big slap in the face of the Pharisees. We read this and it's a parable and we think, oh yeah, you, you know, you, you invite the, the needy and you kind of be nice to others. This is a verbal backhand to the Pharisees. Jesus is not pulling his punches. Verse 22, and the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded and still there is room. And then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall take my supper. We've got three different parables to three different groups of people or individuals. And they're all the same message told a little bit different way to the people he's addressing. 
It's a matter of your heart. First group is the guests who are selfishly seeking honor for themselves. The host who is using people for his own gain. And then the zealous individual who is too occupied with his personal pursuits to see his own problem. Jesus is addressing people who are the religious elite. He could very well be sitting at a Southern Baptist pastor's luncheon, having the same conversation. Because we're no different. Amen? We play these games. We do these things. We have these feelings, these temptations. We have the same selfishness and pride in our hearts that they had in theirs. I think what he is really asking them, I think when it really gets down to it, you boil down these parables that he tells. And I think, that, I think this right here is a good test for where is your heart? Remember, the issue is your heart. Lord, I'm doing all the right religious things. Yeah, but I don't know you. Who, who are the ones that he knows? It's the ones who have their heart turned towards God. It's the ones whose hearts are not turned towards themselves. It's a matter of the heart. And this right here gives us a very good test that we need to look inside ourselves and see what is going on. And the test is, do other people matter? I mean, do they? And, and, and let's, for a moment, let's go ahead, and get, get, go ahead and get all that, you know, I've been raised in church my whole life, religious answers that you know automatically. Let's go ahead and get those out of the way. Yes, they matter. Yes, care, you know, love your neighbor. No, 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 no. Do they really matter to you? Are, you? are are you the main character in your own story and everyone else is just there to be a supporting role? Whenever you encounter people, do, do they matter? Do, do you see an individual or do you just see someone there to serve you? The girl checking you out at the grocery store? She may as well be a computer just taking your money and giving you your food. Or is that a human being there? Or do, you, do you view other people around you as just kind of there to facilitate your life as you move through this world? Or are those people who matter? Matter to God and should matter to you as well. Do people matter or are they just a means to our own prideful ends? Guys, that's hard. Because sometimes it's not just a matter of, you know, you just being a rotten, selfish person. Maybe you're just busy and distracted. But people matter too. Maybe you're just busy going through your day and you, you, you've got what's in front of you and you've got the next thing you've got to do and you know you've got something else you've got to do after that and then there's this other thing, you've got ten things you've got to do and you only got time to do eight of them, but somehow you've got to fit it all in and that's all going through in your mind to so where you're just a little too busy to notice that other human being who is loved by God and who God has commanded to be loved by you. Do other people matter or are they just a means to facilitate our own story as we go through life? And, and I think this is something that we really, I wrestle with, right? To be honest, we're in church. Is this a safe place for me to be honest? Right? It, it, it's hard. It's hard. Because you are busy. Because you do have things to get to. Legitimate things that you need to do. Remember one of the parables where the, he said, hey, come and be with me. And the people said, well, I've got something to do. And the things they had to do were legitimate. Not bad things. But are we willing to say, okay, hold on. I'm going to step back even from what's good. I'm going to make sure that what I'm focusing on is what is best. And that's what God is calling me to do and to be. And it's one of the crazy things that God has made us as human beings to be a social and relational creatures and that the condition of our heart can be manifest if we just look at the way we treat and think about other people. Sometimes it's hard to look in the mirror and see that. But I think if we're all honest, we all know it's there in us. And we just ask God, Lord, I, I, I don't want to be that person. I want to be the one who does, as you say, to love others as myself. 
to do unto others as I would have them do unto me. Lord, help me to be that person. Every time I feel the walls closing Cover me and breathe life in me again Lord, though I feel the darkness come I will not fear You've ransomed me with blood